Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome. We um, open up to Titus chapter 2. I know you guys were expecting Galatians because that's what we do. We finished a book last week. Uh, we will be going into Galatians next week, but I just figured I'd take this opportunity between books to do a prophecy update on what's going on around the world and just to let you know how close we are to Jesus' coming. Now, I know you guys hear me say that all the time, but we are closer than ever before. Amen? Amen. And we're even closer than when I said we're closer. So, we're close. And as we look at some of the things that are going around today, uh, we see that. And we're going to look at some scriptures that is our hope. And we're going to look at some scriptures that we, once we look at them, we're going to say, that's getting into place right now. So, Let's look at Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We could just close up in prayer right there. But let's open up in prayer. <laughs> Lord, we thank You um, that we are looking forward to Your glorious appearing in the clouds to take us out of this place. But until then, Lord, help us be about the Father's business. Help us to have an urgency upon our heart to get the gospel out and to serve you more than we've ever served you before in our life. Lord, bless this time as we look into prophecy and stir our hearts. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Looking for the blessed hope Jesus is our blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Not the coming. Not the second coming. That's different. But the glory appear, glorious appearing. That's when He descends from heaven to shout, the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet. He comes to the clouds and He calls His church out of here. We call it the rapture of the church. The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is He your Savior today? It's important. You need to have that stuff put in place today. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you need Jesus. He died for your sins. All you got to do is come to Him, ask for forgiveness of your sins. Say, Lord, I believe You died on the cross for me. You rose on the third day. You're seated in heaven. Save me. Because we're living in a nutty world. It's crazy. The stuff that's going on. You know, recently, some of these countries that were put in place for the last four years have now been let out of the cage. And the threats that we have from China, from Russia, from Iran, from North Korea, countries that were put in place and contained for the last four years have now been let out of the cage. And they are posturing. And we're going to look at some Scripture today that deals with that. The stuff that's going on in our own country. A country that was founded on God is now God is leaving the building. Because our government doesn't want anything to do with God. Our government thinks they're gods. And we need to be very careful. And we need to be praying. We need to be praying for revival. We need to be praying because in these times of persecution, that's when the church just grows and excels. Because people are asking questions. Unbelievers are saying, are we in the end times? Is this it? Is this the tribulation? Is this where it all gets wrapped up? And people are asking questions. And whenever there's persecution, the church grows. The church grows. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs this week in Chino Hills, Calvary. Huge church. And I said, I, I think we're in for a wild ride this year. And he said, exactly. He said that last year was just a test of the church. And that we could expect way more this year. And his biggest concern was that all the churches that didn't open up last year under the previous administration won't even be able to open up under this current administration. And that the rest of us that are open are going to have to fight to stay open. We're in crazy times where they speak evil of good and good of evil. And so we want to look at prophecy today. We want to look at some things that we know that are going to happen. We want to look to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, Jesus, who I think could come at any day. And you should be encouraged. Did you know that a third of the Bible is prophecy? 
And prophecy is so important. I, I, I don't understand these people who only study the New Testament and they say, well, we don't need the Old Testament. Oh, really? If you don't understand the Old Testament, you will never understand the book of Revelation, which comes with a blessing to the one that reads it. We need to understand prophecy. We need to protect ourselves against deception. But if you don't know God's Word and you don't know the Bible and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will be deceived. The Bible says for the unbeliever, Satan has blinded his eyes to the truth. And don't we see that? That's why when you watch the news, you yell at the TV. You're like, can't they see that? And the, the most brilliant minds in the world look like fools before Christ. And even you. Because you have the Creator of all things living in you, bearing witness that what they're saying is silly. Bible prophecy is not to scare us, it's to prepare us. And it should make you excited. Because more people than ever before, worldwide, are asking about God. They're asking about God. They're downloading Bible apps. They're downloading sermons. They're downloading commentaries more than ever before, worldwide. Unbelievers are asking about the Bible. They're asking about the last days. They want to know. They're coming to Christians because they know we stand for something that's true. You may have been witnessing to somebody for years, but when they get in trouble, who do they come to? They come to you because they know that you're going to give them truth. And right now, all around the world, people are talking about America and Israel more than ever before. We're in all the, the papers because why? Because our country's collapsing, our economy's collapsing. These new policies that are coming in are going to collapse everything. And now Israel is under a threat again. So all around the world, people are talking about America. They're talking about Israel. And now war is on the table like no, never before. A full-on war. So today I want to give you some prophecy to show you how close we are to the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming for you. Are you ready? Do you have everything in order? If you don't, you might want to stop me right now and run up here and get saved. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, that we're in perilous times. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power, and from such people turn away. Wow, sugar-coat it. Did he miss anything there? I don't think so. <laughs> the Bible says that in the last days there'll be a push for a one-world rule. Uh, are we seeing it? The World Economic Forum, the WEF, is pushing for that. We are one of the last countries that needs to flip to socialism in order for that to happen. Because according to the World Economic Forum, the, the Christians and capitalism are the root to all evil. We've got to get that out of the way. And if our country flips, and it looks like we probably will, then the One World Program is going to be set in place. And I don't know how long it takes to, to get that in place. And then we know that God will take His church out and God will pour out His wrath on a Christ-rejecting world for seven years. So comfort one another with that. You say, what kind of comfort is that? It's the best. Why? Because we're not going to be here. We're not going to be here. We are not looking for the wrath of God. We are not looking for the tribulation. We are not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ and His glorious appearing to call us out of this place. In Luke 21, 36, I'm going to go through a lot of verses. Don't, don't try to turn there. Just If you're taking notes, write them down, read them later, because I, I know I'm going to be late today, and i got a lot to say. Luke 21, 36, Jesus says to his disciples pertaining to the tribulation, telling them all the things that were going to happen, he says this. He says, watch therefore. Are you watching? Are you discerning the times and the seasons? No man knows the hour. 
But do you see everything getting in place? He says, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So how am I accounted worthy to escape the tribulation? Uh, Know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior. Paul, when he was in Thessalonica, he was only there three weeks. And it blows me away because he taught them in three weeks. He gave them the gospel. They got saved. And then he taught them about the rapture. He taught them about the tribulation. He taught them about the Antichrist, the second coming. He taught them all these things. And I thought, man, three-week-old Christians. I know for me, like when people come to me and they say, I'm a new believer, I say, read Romans, read John. Well, what do I do after that? Then read Romans and read John. Well, then what? Then read Romans and read John. This guy went in, you know, into the book of Revelation in a sense. He, he, he started teaching on the rapture of the church, the, the, the tribulation, the Antichrist, and in three weeks, and he was run out. And they felt like they missed the rapture and that they were in the tribulation because some phony letters had circulated and that Nero was the Caesar at the time and he was, he was killing people. He was killing Christians. He was using their bodies as human torches to light his garden parties. And this false letter had circulated that they had missed the rapture. And Paul said, no, you didn't. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he said, to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus is going to deliver us from the wrath to come. The wrath is not referring to hell. The wrath is referring to the seven-year tribulation. Jesus will deliver us from the wrath to come. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19, he says, For what is our hope? Our joy, our crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? At His appearing? Are you watching the skies? Are you ready to fly? I am. If you're not, it's either you're backslidden or you're getting married next week and you want to wait one more week. Right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13 says this, So, that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Did you know Jesus is coming with all His saints? How many of you know someone that has died that believed in Jesus? Raise your hand. They've gone to be with the Lord. They're coming back with Him. Amen? See, the Thessalonians thought that they had Missed it. Paul says, no, you haven't missed it. Jesus hasn't come yet. Nero's not the Antichrist. He's a type of an Antichrist. Anybody that's opposing Christ is an Antichrist. But the real Antichrist that we always talk about of Revelation, I believe is alive today, but won't be revealed till we're gone. See, the reference that he makes here is with all the saints. That shows you that when Jesus comes back, it'll be with all the saints who have died And then we that are alive and remain will be caught up in the clouds with them. So what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, lest your sorrow as others who have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. What is sleep? It refers to to the body dying, the body dying. It does not refer to the soul. There is no such thing as soul sleep like some of the cults teach. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us absent from the body, present with the Lord. So it refers to the body that's left behind, the body that's buried, the body, the ashes that are sprinkled. In 1 Thessalonians 4.15, he says this, For this we say, to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be by no means proceed those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What is he talking about? He's talking about all those that have died in Jesus are already in the presence of the Lord, absent from the body, present of the Lord, but their bodies are still here. 
And so what he's saying is that when that trumpet blows, those bodies are going to blow out of the grave. That's going to freak some people out. This corruptible flesh will be raised incorruptible. In Matthew 27, 52, after the resurrection of Jesus, it said, and the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, there's our word, were raised. And coming out of the graves after the, his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Wow, that must have freaked some people out. When we die, we immediately go into the presence of God. But these bodies don't, right? We bury them or we cremate and we sprinkle their ashes out at the bay, right? But when the rapture happens in a moment, in a twinkling of the eyes, these bodies are going to blow out of the grave. Unbelievers are going to freak out. They're going to be driving past Kaalia, that cemetery right there at the beach, and all of a sudden all these bodies are going to blow out of the grave. They're going to think it's a zombie apocalypse. Guys will be out surfing the bay, and how many thousands have been sprinkled out in the bay? They will just blow out of the water like popsicles just flying towards the sky as a testimony to the true and living God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, it says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, <clears throat> and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Can I get an amen? amen. Comfort one another with these words. You know, there's a lot of dear friends I have that, that believe that we're in the tribulation or we're going to go through the tribulation. We're not going through the tribulation. He says, comfort one another with these words. It, you know, if, if we were going through the tribulation, where would be the comfort? Oh, oh, let me comfort you, bro. Okay, so you chose Jesus, so now we're going to have our heads cut off. Be comforted. That's not a comfort. See, there's a difference between the church and tribulation saints. The church is the bride of Christ. Tribulation saints are not the bride of Christ. Because when the rapture takes place, the bride of Christ goes up. Then the tribulation starts. God pours out His wrath on a Christ-ejecting world. But in His grace, He will save Israel in that period. And in His grace, He will save the unbelieving Gentiles. But they will have to give their life for Jesus Christ. There's a difference between the church and the tribulation saints. The church is told to live for Jesus the tribulation saints are told to die for Jesus. We are to be a living testimony in this world as we walk in this world as the light of God is a reflection of Jesus Christ. But in the tribulation, their testimony will be their death. So my question to you today is, do you know Jesus? Are you saved? If the Lord came today, would you go? Because you need to understand that once the church is taken off this earth, all hell is going to break loose. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, For God did not appoint us to wrath. You want to circle that one. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, and whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul has to comfort the Thessalonians because he's, a false letter had circulated that they missed the rapture and they were in the tribulation and that Nero was the Antichrist. And Paul says, no. He says the church has to be gone for the Antichrist to be revealed. And if you want to know if the Antichrist is on the earth today, we will be taken out and then he'll be revealed. But I believe he's alive. I really do. That's how close I think we are. Right now, the Holy Spirit is restraining evil. You're, you're probably thinking, if the Holy Spirit's restraining evil, He's not doing a very good job. Well, you have no idea how crazy it is going to get when He stops restraining evil. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we see everything getting into place right now. Let me read you Ezekiel 38. God says to Ezekiel, this is another message that came to me from the Lord. And so the Lord is speaking to Ezekiel. And he says, Son of man, turn and face Gog in the land of Magog. 
Let me just read this. Don't take time turning there because you're going to miss what I want to say. Son of man, turn and face Gog of the land of Magog, the prince that rules over the nations, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Gog, G-O-G, Gog. It's a title. It's not a person in a sense, a name. It's a, it's a person of a title. <clears throat> he is the, the leader or the prince of Rosh. Russia. Okay? He's talking about Russia right here. These are the ancient times, uh, the land of Magog, Russia, Meshach and, Meshach and Tubal are part of that. He says, prophesy against the leader of Russia. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. Wow. Is that heavy? God is saying to Russia, I am your enemy. Russia is posturing itself against us. He says, I will turn you around. I will put hooks in your jaws to lead you out of the, your out with your whole army. Your horses, your charioteers, in full armor, a great horde armed with shields and swords. Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer, which is the area of Ukraine and Romania, and all its armies will also join you along with the armies of Beth Tergama, which is Turkey, from the distant north and many others. All these nations are going to come up against Israel. He says, get ready. Be prepared. Keep all the armies around you mobilized and take command of them. A long time from now, you will be called into action. A long, this was written like 570 B.C., so it's been like 2,600 years. And it's starting to come about right before our eyes. A long time from now, you will be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. We saw that happening in 1948. You and all your allies, a vast, awesome army, will roll down on them like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. At that time, evil thoughts will be coming to your mind and you will devise a wicked scheme. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages and I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. I will go to these formerly desolated cities that are now filled with people who have returned from exile from many nations. I will capture vast amounts of plunder for the people are rich with livestock and possessions now, they that think the whole world revolves around them. But Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will ask, do you really think that the armies that you've gathered can rob of silver and gold? Do you think you can drive away their livestock and seize their goods and carry it off? Sheba and Dedan is Saudi Arabia. The, this, the merchants of Tarshish refer to Spain, uh, the British Isles and the, and the nations over there, they're saying, what are you doing? These are, these are the guys who be like, stand up at the UN and go, what's going on here? They shouldn't be doing this, but nobody's going to do anything about it. Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. When my people are living in peace in their land, then you will arouse yourselves. You will come from your homeland in the distant north with your vast cavalry and your mighty army. And you will attack my people, Israel, covering the land like a cloud. And at this time in the distant future, I will bring you against my land as everyone watches and my holiness will be displayed by what happens to you, Gog. Then all the nations will know that I am the Lord. Amen? All these countries, all these countries are going to come against Israel. These countries have been contained for some time now, for the last four years, but now they are loosened. It talks about here Russia. It talks about here Iran. It talks about Turkey, Romania, Ukraine, Ethiopia, Libya, and many others. Who's the others? We don't know. Is it China? Is it North Korea? We don't know and many others are going to come up against Israel and God is going to smoke them and wipe out the army. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> 
<clears throat> excuse me. Gog is a title of a world leader who has absolute power. Absolute political power, absolute military power. We don't have that in the U.S. We have a legis legislative branch, an executive branch, a judicial branch set up by the Old Testament, which will probably be changed soon. But Russia fits that now. For this to take place, Israel had to be back in the land. That took place in 1948. Israel is the only nation in history that was a nation, ceased to be a nation, and became a nation some 2,000 years later. Is that crazy or what? May 14th, 1948, Israel became a nation again. May 15th, 1948, a day after they became a nation, they got bombed. They got bombed in Tel Aviv, and then Egypt declared an invasion. They, they'd only been a nation one day. They didn't even have an army, and they won. Why? God. God keeps His promises to Israel. It shows me that my Bible is true. My Bible it says prophecy, and I believe it's going to happen, and now we've seen it unfold right before our eyes. In 1948, Israel became a nation. The Bible said that Gog would be the prince of Rosh, Russia. It was formerly the Soviet Union. But on December 26, 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed and Russia began. So what was so confusing to us a hundred years ago, maybe, is now coming alive before our eyes. So with this message, you should be getting excited. You say, well, I don't know if I'm excited. Why not? <laughs> Listen, what's happening today should make you excited. If what's happening today makes you feel like you're being run over by a truck, you've got the wrong attitude. <laughs> because Jesus is coming. That should excite you. These things have to happen for our Lord to come for us. That's how close we are today. We need to understand that. And God is speaking to you today. He is saying, get ready. Get prepared. Get things in order. Get the gospel out. I'm coming soon. He's about to wrap this whole thing up. So as we look at today, we see a great awakening taking place. Not just a spiritual awakening, but we do see a spiritual awakening happen worldwide, but we are also seeing an evil awakening. Because just in the last couple of weeks, Iran's awakened. Russia's awakened. China's awakened. North Korea has awakened. And these countries that were contained for the last four years are now being let out of the cage, and they are posturing. Look around. In the last two weeks, there's been a global shift in the players just mentioned. Good news? God's in control. Jesus is on the throne. God is shaking up our world. And through the shaking, people get saved. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 says this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. That's the gospel. And I will fill this house with glory. That's his temple, says the Lord God Almighty. He is shaking us up. And when he shakes us up, people get saved. How many people got saved last year? Worldwide. Crazy. Even in Muslim countries. Record-breaking Bible apps, commentaries, sermons being downloaded and in Muslim countries. Jesus is coming. He shakes us up. God knows what's going on in our nation. And there's a healthy and much-needed division taking place in what we call church today. We are starting to see who's really His. A lot of churches have buckled in this last year. Never to be open again. Others have complied to political correction, bowed down to government control, want to be politically correct. Churches are switching to embrace homosexuality, abortion. And God is bringing a healthy and much needed division to take place so you and I know who's really His. Hebrews chapter 
12, 20, verse 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, isn't that awesome? Our kingdom can't be shaken. We just read in Haggai that he's going to shake up the world. But our kingdom can't be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. God says, you don't need to be shaken. He says, I got you. Now, some of us, we're Christians, we're human. We get a little shaken, we get a little rattled. God says, calm down, I got you. You're going to be okay. You've got to keep telling yourself that. We forget. We forget who's on the throne sometimes. And sometimes we need to get off that throne and stop trying to control everything in our life. Give it to Jesus. He's got this. And so in order for Ezekiel 38 to happen, we had to see something take place. Israel had to become a nation again. And when Israel became a nation in 1948, that was a kickoff for Ezekiel 38 to start. To start getting in place. And it's game on. Israel was without a country for some 2,000 years. And during that 2,000 years, people came up with this bad teaching of replacement theology that the church replaced Israel. That's heresy. The church has never replaced Israel. If God doesn't keep His promises to Israel, you have no hope. Do you know that? If God can't keep His promises to Israel, you've got nothing to stand on. God says His covenant with Israel was everlasting. He said, I will bring you back from the ends of the earth and place you back in the land. Isn't God good? And my Bible is true. And prophecy unfolded right before our eyes in 1948 because if God doesn't keep His promises to Israel, we've got nothing. What makes you think He'll keep His promises to you? Thank God that He keeps His promises. He's going to keep His promises to you. He's going to keep His promises to Israel. Remember, you and I were grafted in in what the Bible says is the commonwealth of Israel. We are going to heaven because the gospel came to Israel first. And persecution always causes the church to grow. That's why it exploded in the early church era. Because they were being persecuted. And during this time of a global shaking... It is time to get the gospel out more than ever before. Listen, guys. This is not a beatdown or trying to rah-rah, sis-boom-bah, but get the gospel out. Seize the moment. We are called fishers of men, and it's time to throw the net. The harvest is great. During this time is when people are so sensitive to hear what the Bible says. And God is using you and saying, listen, throw the net. Get out there. Be available. Preach the gospel. Don't just do that on Sundays, but do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Get it out there. Time is short. I'm coming. What if he told you he's going to be here tomorrow? Would you be busy all day? Would he be worth it? Persecution brings revival. Remember the lockdown? We all shut down because we didn't know what we were up against and we were just concerned. We are trying to be good, good Christians. And then when we real, realized it was turning more into a political thing and the numbers weren't adding up and we opened back, up, back up and we just said, listen, you know, I'm not, we're not going to shut this down again. This is, this is crazy. When we opened back up, there were people that never came back. And this is, I'm hearing this all over the, the nation. And, and I understand if they have health issues, I get that. That stay home, watch it on TV. I get that. But there are people that are able that use this opportunity to never come back. But you know how good God is? God filled those seats with new people. People who never knew the Lord and were hungry to find out about the Lord. And I don't know if you remember, you know, we've been doing a lot of altar calls and people have been getting saved like crazy. And, and I remember a couple months ago when we did an altar call and we asked people to get up out of their seats and come forward. Both services, this whole front area was filled with people that wanted to be saved. Filled. And two weeks later, we did a baptism and it was the biggest baptism we ever done in the history of our church. People just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. What is that? That's nothing that we did. We're just a bunch of knuckleheads. It's what God did. Revival. Revival is coming. God is on the move. 
people are getting saved. And he's saying to you and me, get out there, throw the net, get busy. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to deal. Just get there, get in the zone. He'll do the rest. Just be available. We saw so many people get saved in the Philippines on missions trips. Listen, this is, this is how easy spreading the gospel is. I used to say to people, you could go into the Philippines, into a city, and sneeze, and people would get saved. So you just get out there and sneeze. I don't know how to say it. doesn't matter. Just get out there and throw the net. We need to understand something. In America, as we know it, is falling apart. Don't kid yourself. We're not the America that we used to be. We're falling apart. And we need to seize this opportunity to get the gospel out. America went from a year ago of being powerful, prosperous, full of success and freedom, to crippling fear, confusion, a destroyed economy, a loss of liberty and freedom in just a short time. Our nation failed to look up, and America as we know it is no more. The Biden administration announced that the troops in Washington would not be going home that they would remain till March. One congressman said it is to induce fear into the populace and to display an administrative no-nonsense willingness to use military powers against its citizens. On Inauguration Day, I don't know if you noticed, but there wasn't anybody there. It was replaced with uh, fences, walls put up all around the building, razor wire on top, Thousands of military armed troops surrounding the perimeter. No citizens. First time in the history of our nation. The Biden administration is working as we speak to ensure that no other party will ever get into office. According to one congressman, the recounting of illegal votes is evidence that there will be no voting integrity in the future. He said, we are headed to a socialistic member of a globalist state. National policies are now being exchanged for socialism. Human rights is the the number one prevailing argument in human rights right now is the gay agenda. The Constitution is being changed as we speak. The policies that they're putting in place are anti-God. We watched Joe Biden put his hand... I know I'm going to get in trouble for all this. You watch him put his left hand on the Bible and swear to uphold the laws of our land and the Constitution according to God's Word. And while his hand was on the Bible, his other hand was writing off pro-abortion. His other hand was writing out against Israel. His other hand was writing against traditional marriage and supporting a gay agenda. His other hand was taking away religious freedoms. And so when you hear God bless America, you don't know what God they're talking about. I have a video for you. Let me run it. This is opening Congress. Is that disgusting or what? Now, most of you heard this and came to me in the last couple weeks and said, listen, um, you were outraged by the amen, a woman. That was the least of the problem. The main problem was that this Democrat, Republican, Emmanuel Cleaver prayed to the monotheistic God, Brahma, and the God known by many names, by many different faiths, a man and a woman. Heresy. In the name of the monotheistic God. You and I are monotheistic. We worship one God, Yahweh, the creator of all things. That's what that means. Worshippers of one God. This guy said, in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma. Brahma is a Hindu God. They call him the God of all creation. The Hindus worship 33 million gods. It's not monotheistic at all. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You're saying this guy doesn't know what he's talking about? Did the pastor just say that? Read my lips. 
this guy does not know what he's talking about. He has just created the biggest act of treason against the God of heavens by calling the God of heavens Brahma. This is an outrage. I'll show you who Brahma is if we have that picture. Brahma is a multi-faced, multi-armed God that was made by hand, man's hands and has to be taken care of by man's hands, has to be polished by man's hands. Our God created man. He is not Brahma. This, this freaks me out. You can take that off. Listen, who are we worshiping in America now? Who is our government trusting in? Listen, just a couple of days ago, presidential prayer was opened up by a representative, Jamal Bowman, representative of New York, for the presidential prayer. He's a full-on Muslim. I don't know if you know the book they, they trust in, the Koran. It says, kill all Christians and Jews. Kill all those of the book, speaking of the Bible. God has left the building. God has left our country. God has left D.C. We have dissed God for decades as a nation, and now God is gone. God has not gone from you. He's gone from our government. But he promises in his word he has to judge the nations. And he's going to judge our nations. America has to go away in order to fulfill prophecy. And he's going to judge our nations. When, when we say in our country now, in God we trust, you don't know what God they're talking about. Is, this, is that the God that's running our, our government now? Or is it Allah? America has lost its position with God. And the funny thing is, is that we think we're in control. The funny thing is, is that governments and governors and politicians think they're running the whole thing. They think they're God. Psalm 2 tells us that God sits in the heavens and He laughs. He laughs. These governors who think they're gods, these politicians who think they're running the show, God sits up in heaven and laughs. He's like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? These big tech guys we see of these big corporations, trillion dollar industries, multi-billion dollar billionaires who think because they have all this money that they have the power to shut down leaders of nations. And if you talk against us, we will shut you down. They think they're controlling countries now, these big tech guys. And if you say anything about them, they're going to silence you on social media. They're already silencing leaders of nations. These guys like the owners of, of Google, the Zuckerbergs, Facebook, Dorsey, Twitter, Bill Gates. Bill Gates thinks he's running the show. Bill Gates thinks he's managing the world because he's so rich. His, him and his wife are so against Christians, his wife wears an upside-down cross to antagonize Christians. Bill Gates thinks that we need to get rid of some people on this planet in order for the rest of us to be able to have a sustained life. And his whole goal is to remove some of the population down to a more acceptable number. Well, Bill, guess what? Don't waste all your time and money on it. God's going to do it for free. <laughs> America has lost its position with God, and God must judge the nation's but God is not going to judge you. He must judge the nations for their sins, but he already dealt with your sins at the cross. That's the good news. Our country is falling apart. We are losing our freedoms and our rights. But through the persecution, the church will grow. Why? Because God is on the move. God is on the move. We may not have America anymore, but we have God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Amen? <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. 
awakening us, opening our eyes to see what's going on, showing us how close you are. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, empower us by the Holy Spirit (laughs) to be strengthened, to move in your power, to see people get saved. Lord, we need a filling. We need your power. We need your grace. We need wisdom from above. Give us a hunger for your word and a desire to be on our knees to talk to you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, get that thing right right now. Pray in your heart, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead three days later. Jesus, save me now. If you just prayed that in your heart, you're a child of God. Now go out and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.